All right, so uh, let's go over a couple of the questions from the exam that uh, people struggled with. Um, so maybe that won't happen on the final uh, grade breakdown for the exam. Uh, class average was a 73. Um, there was uh, five, you know, A's, four B's, five C's, four D's, two F's, and one really bad F and one really, really, really bad F. Um, so uh, that's the grade breakdown. Um, so I think you could probably see if you're in this, uh, uh, you know, the 14 people out of the 22 who took the test, if you are in this range up here, I would say you're doing uh, reasonably well. Maybe you lost 10 points for, you know, a dumb mistake or just, you know, just didn't know how to do one of the questions. And uh, once you see it today, you'd be like, well, whatever. Um, you know, I would be a little bit concerned if you're in this range here. Uh, unless you just had an off day or whatever, um, you start getting down into the the four folks down in this area. Um, you know, I'm not encouraging anybody to necessarily drop the class, but um, you want to really sit down and evaluate why you did poorly. Um, go ahead. I don't. That's not possible. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm not going to go through all the questions because some of them were fairly obvious. So the error-free error Hello World program, uh, most people did uh, just fine on. Um, the points missed there was when somebody just wrote the main method instead of, you know, like the whole class that then also has a main method in it. Um, so let's see, a new keyword. Uh, that one was probably actually missed more than it should have been. Remember, that's our real estate agent. Um, uh, the uh, concept for, uh, uh, so that goes and gets us new memory for whether it's an object or an array or something like that. You know, the reason it's required for arrays was kind of the piece that was missed most often is arrays require contiguous memory, memory in a row right next to each other. Um, so some kind of explanation related to that. Um, uh, char primitive type actually stored as a 16-bit integer. Uh, that's actually went fairly well. Uh, that's something related to Unicode. Um, so Unicode is a 16-bit uh, unsigned value. So it's 0 to 65,536 or 535 rather. So there's 65,536 unique characters covering the larger alphabet. Um, uh, if you, uh, uh, from different languages, if you kind of fit in their Unicode or explained effectively the use of Unicode without saying the word Unicode, you were in good shape. Um, let's see, uh, necessary code to print out all the numbers between one and 100,000. Um, it was just a loop uh, to do that. I'll actually write the coding things uh, uh, real quick while we're uh, in here. I'll, let me just do it like in Adam maybe. All right, so the question was, write the necessary code. Um, let's see, where are we at? To define an integer array capable of holding 25 integers. All you had to do is define the array. You didn't have to put anything in there. So that's int array AR is equal to new int array 25. So that will define an integer array capable of holding 25 integers. All right, uh, let's see. Write the necessary code to print all the numbers between one and 100,000. You got to use a loop. Okay, so again, this was just writing some code. I didn't ask for a method. I didn't ask for a class, things like that. I mean, if you, if you did it correctly and you did it in the context of that, that's okay, but I wasn't asking uh, for all that. So I asked you to write the code that um, prints all the numbers between one and 100,000. So if you only went up to uh, 99,000, uh, 
999, that's fine, you know, because you, you, you could read that a couple different ways. But um, so we'll say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than, or you can say less than or equal to 100,000. We're actually going to start i off at one. So no. Huh? You're on page. It's a, it's a not, not muted. <laughs> uh, let's see. I guess it was better than last uh, week's or whatever. <laughs> All right, and then we want to print. So system dot out dot print i. So this for loop will go through and print all the values between one and 100,000. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on a second here. Was anybody online going to tell me I wasn't sharing my screen? That's just evidence they're not paying any attention. Um, or was I sharing the screen? Maybe I was sharing the screen. You're sharing. Yeah, you're sharing. Okay. Now I'm resharing. Got it. All right. Um, let's see. So next one. What does the following code do? Uh, like I talked about in class uh, and also from last semester, when I ask questions showing you some code, I ask you what it does. I'm not asking you to take me line by line telling me what that line does. I want to know what does this code accomplish? Okay, what is the output of this code? Um, so this code, you know, we've defi defined a couple of variables here. We're uh, going to go through a loop as long as i is still less than j. We're going to print out the value of i each time. So i start off as five. So we're going to print out five. Then we're going to print out eight. Then we're going to print out an eleven. Each time through, i grows by three. J grows by one. So eventually, i passes up j after eleven. So eleven goes to fourteen, and j was currently twelve, which goes to a thirteen. So that's why we pass it. So the output of this is going to be five, eight, and eleven. All right, so uh, next one. So this has probably missed um, a reasonable uh, amount. Um, so one thing we should know how to do by now is this idea of defining an object in terms of the blueprint for an object and then also using those objects someplace else, understanding the difference between those two. I want to create something I can use later and then I actually use it. So something I saw quite a bit was people creating instances of their object inside of the constructor. All right, so we're going to write a simple object called player that's going to keep track of three pieces of information, a first name, a last name, and a jersey number. So maybe a string, a string, and an int. And then we're supposed to write a constructor for that. So I wanted you to show me you kind of knew how to write constructors in Java. So we would do something like public class player. And then this guy would have a private string. What did I say to keep track of? First name, last name. So f name, private string l name, private int jersey number. Then we'll have our constructor for player that has to match the name of the class. So constructors in Java match the name of the class. And this guy's going to take in a string, a string, and an int. And we'll set this dot f name equal to f name, this dot l name equal to l name, this dot jersey number equal to jersey number. All right, so there is your simple object that keeps track of three fields with a reasonable constructor that initializes those fields. That's all you had to write for that one. Write a simple object named player that keeps track of a first name, a last name, and a jersey number, include an appropriate constructor. All right, so that one was missed more than it should have been. So questions about that. Uh, I had quite a few where uh, you didn't have a constructor in there. You, you just randomly threw like a main method inside of here. Remember, the program that you actually run is the one that has main. 
this object would be meant to be used somewhere else. So maybe somewhere else I'd have like my public class driver. And then inside here I'd have public static void main. And then maybe I would create a player P1 is equal to a new player, you know, Mike Littman 27, something like that. And I can create then another instance of player Dave Smith 13, something like that. So this is my blueprint up here. That's how we define an object. This is how we create instances of that object. We might do that in main or in some other function that main ultimately takes us to. All right, so the thing I saw most for people who struggled with this one is they somehow merge these two animals together into this one thing. All right, um, so understand that main, all programs begin and end with main, all programs begin and end with main. We said this last semester, we said it again. This is the dude that drives our program. Hence the reason I tend to call these class, this class called driver, all right? This guy is something, is a tool that we built that we intend to use in our program. So this question was about showing me the code to define that tool. I didn't ask you to use it. I didn't ask you to create instances of it uh, or anything like that. It's here is an object called player that keeps track of three pieces of information. And here's the constructor that could be used to build one of those guys. And the follow through example, which I didn't ask for in this question, some people gave it to me, that's fine. I mean, if, if you gave me more than I asked for, as long as you didn't merge the two together into some sort of mutant beast, I mean, that was fine. I didn't take points off or anything, but this would be an example of using that player construct that takes in a string, a string, and an int. A string, a string, and an int. And here's another use of that constructor that takes in a different string, a different string in an int. And we're putting those in variables called uh, P1 and P2 in this example. All right, questions about that one. Okay. Um, next one, uh, actually in general, People did pretty well on this question. Um, a few people, uh, once I went back and looked at scores and then was wondering, well, this person usually doesn't miss points. They really seem to get the stuff. Um, and they got a zero on this one. And the problem is, is if you give me the wrong answer, but don't show me the work, I can't see where you went south. All right, so, you know, I specifically gave you a conversion from hex to binary because you can use the shortcut for that guy. So 1B9C So you can represent every one of the hex tets as 4 bits. So this is 0001 is the um uh, the one. A B is actually an 11. So that is a that is an eight plus a three, so one zero one zero. Uh, actually, that guy. Eight plus a three, so eight plus a two plus a one. So that's our eleven, which is a representative B. A nine would be one zero zero one, and then a C is a twelve, so that's an eight four. So that's a twelve zero zero. So the binary version of this guy, you know, if you left spaces, that's fine. Is that guy. So some people who miss points on this just gave me this, but maybe gave me the wrong value. Might have had a couple of things missing in there or something like that. But because I couldn't see how you got to it, I didn't see, you know, maybe like a common thing might be that you decided that a C was a 13 test pressure, you, you know, alphabet, you zigged and zigged instead of zagged when you were walking through the alphabet, instead of going 10, 11, 12, you somehow arrived at a 13 or something like that. But if you didn't show me where you made your mistake, then I, I couldn't give you, uh, 
uh, points. So remember that for next time. I know it's easy to get overconfident in questions like this and do it all in your head or something, but you know, at least show me your breakdown. If you know, so a lot of people, uh, so some people who got like a nine out of 10 on it, something like that, where you, your final answer was, was technically wrong, but you showed me like a one is this guy. And then you show me a B was something like, you know, that or something like that, which isn't a B, but you showed me that you were trying to map a B to its equivalent four bits and uh, it just didn't work out. Uh, so keep try, uh, keep that in mind for the future. And remember that you uh, do get to replace your midterm exam score with your final exam score if you do better on the final. All right, next one. Uh, this one was missed uh, way, way, way too much. And it was because people didn't seem to know what a method is. All right, so write a method named count spaces that takes a string as a parameter, returns the number of spaces contained within the string. So this guy's going to return a number. So it's going to return an int. Call this guy count spaces. It's going to take a string as a parameter. This is a method. And we're going to go through every character in that string asking, is this guy a space or not? So I'm going to keep uh, track of a count. Start off at zero. I have found zero spaces. For int i is equal to zero. i is less than s dot length. That's the number of characters in s. i plus plus each time through we'll ask a question. If s dot char at i is equivalent to the character space count plus plus. After that for loop's done, return count. All right, so this guy is a method. I had people that just said something like public class driver and just threw like a while loop in there or something like that. So that's a class. That's something more like what we wrote up here. This is a the player object. This is a class that contains fields and constructors and potentially methods. We don't have any methods in this particular one, but this is a class. A method has a return type. It has a name. It has zero or more parameters, and then it has its logic. Since we've advertised it's going to return an int, you will return an int at the end of it. If you threw static in front of this, that's OK. That's related to the next question. Still a method. It just happens to be written as a class method now instead of an instance method. Still a method. All right. Uh, I would actually say this one was probably the most missed um, in class, if I do, if I recall. Um, and the people who missed it like horribly were the ones who didn't even know it was what a method was. All right, questions about this. All right, then the last one um, wasn't horrible, but the answers probably weren't as good as they should have been given that I kind of refer to this as like this mantra that you should have memorized and it's the super important concept and helps you understand how to read the documentation when you go and look at the documentation. Um, I got a, a bunch of pretty verbose answers that once I read it two or three times I figured that you pretty much knew what you were talking about. Um, but I'm asking kind of two separate questions here. How can you tell the difference between a class method and an instance method at the time of their definition. Okay, so we're looking at when they're being defined, what's the difference between those guys versus when we actually go and use them, how can you tell the difference? All right, so when we're defining a class method, defining a class method requires that you put the static keyword in front. Instance methods do not. That's it. When we're defining it, similar. The idea of defining something, here's, here's an example up here where we have defined an object. We're not using it yet. We're defining it here. 
Okay, so when I talk about so the, the time of something being defined, that would be this kind of situation, as opposed to when we go to actually use it, that would be that kind of situation. All right, this is dealing with objects instead of uh, methods, but same kind of concept here. There's a point where we create the ability and nothing forces us to ever use the ability. You know, we go to Home Depot and buy a chainsaw. We bring that chainsaw home. We have a chainsaw, but we might never actually use it. All right, that's just a wasted resource. So if we're only looking at the definition of a class method, we will see the keyword static there. If it's not a class method or it's an instance method, we won't see the keyword static. That is the only difference between those two methods visually. Now the logic behind them might be a little different. Like why would I create something via static method versus an instance method? And that's a whole different kind of question. But for, if I'm looking at the definition of a method, I can instantly tell you, is this a class method or instance method by looking for one word, static. Now the other part of this question was how do you call a class method when you use it in your program? So that's the next one. How do you call a class method? We call a class method using the name of the class in which the method was defined. So we wrote early on in the semester, we wrote several of our class methods inside of our driver class. So down below main, we had static something, had a bunch of methods, and we would say driver dot something or other, whatever the name of the method was. Some people met, uh, mentioned here that you can just use the name of the method instead of the next part is going to be we have, we have to use an instance of the class in which it was defined to call it. Technically, if you said, well, to call a class method, you don't actually have to use the name of the class if you are currently inside of that class. You're inside something called a static context. And we talked about this in class, but I also mentioned that it's never wrong to use the name of the class. And if you are calling a class method um, from a different class, uh, like maybe the character class, character class has class methods in it, like is uppercase, and you're writing this inside of your driver class, you can't just say is uppercase because is uppercase is something you did not define inside of your driver class. It was defined inside the character class. And since it's a static method inside the character class, we would call it by saying character dot is uppercase using the name of the class in which the method is defined. All right. So understand that just because in certain circumstances, you don't have to put anything in front of the method name. It happens to work until you fully understand why it randomly happens to work in those situations. The correct way to think about this is class methods are always, always, always called using the name of the class in which the method was defined. You will never get it wrong if you do that. If you're inside driver and you say driver dot whatever the name of your method is, it's not wrong. And you'll have less of a chance of spelling it wrong using a, pro, a tool like Eclipse or something that'll do uh, completion for you. When you say driver dot and type in the first letter, it'll show you the, the method. All right, so that's the sec second part of this question. Third part, how do you call an instance method when you use it in your program? We call an instance method using an instance of the class in which the method was defined. So for example, if we're for example, if we're using the if we're using the length method inside the string class, the length method from the string class does not have the keyword static in front of it if we were to look at the definition. Therefore, it's an instance method. We call that instance method using an instance of the class in which it was defined. So we would first need to create an instance of a string, like string s equals hello. Then we can say s dot length. We can say string s2 is equal to elephant. Then we can say s2 dot length. Instance methods are called using an instance of the class in which that method was defined. 
So if we were looking at that method's definition and we did not see static in front of it, in order to call that method, we would first need to create an instance of that class and then we can call one of the instance methods. Okay. So part one of the question, part two of the question, part three of the question. Simplify your life by getting those three points down. Okay, and um, I mean, some of you was obvious you still understood it. It was just difficult to maybe explain it. Uh, I got some walls of paragraphs <laughs> for, for some of these, okay? But at the top level here, we're just looking for one word, static versus not static. So if you didn't have the key, if you didn't mention the word static in your answer, that was probably gonna be problematic. And this other uh, part is the difference between calling it and defining it, understanding that difference. Okay, is that all the questions? Yep. So, um, questions about anything on the exam? I have a question, Dr. Whitman. Sure. Is there a way we can see the well, what we got wrong on the exam in Blackboard? It should be on there. It's, oh my God. Yeah, I wasn't able to go back and look. That is killing me. All right, hold on. I have to, let me go back here. Okay, exam. Let me do edit test options. It said after attempts are graded, show the score per question, answers correct and submitted feedback. I have all that set up. Um, here, let's maybe do the same thing against the due date. All right, try that, refresh. That work? All right, and you should see, I have, if you got something wrong, I, I have feedback. I like to say why it was wrong. Yeah, it's working on. Okay. I wonder it's, I'm trying to think why it does that. When I grade the exams, I grade them with the names off and I grade them one question at a time. So I wonder since, you know, that means that when I grade your personal exam, all of question number one's being graded, then all of question number two is being graded. I wonder if that means that it doesn't flag when I finally grade question 10, that your exam has been graded because I did it in 10 parts. I don't know, whatever. Um, okay, but if you do have questions about any of the grading, want me to explain what, uh, why I took whatever points off, I, I gave you feedback, but if that doesn't make sense to you, just reach out to me on uh, Slack and we can uh, um, talk about it. If you deserve some points back, I'll give you some points back. If you uh, deserve less points, I'll take those. <laughs> uh, I usually don't do that. <laughs> but Okay, so let's now go back over to, um, oh, one more thing I do want to uh, bring up on the statistics thing here. I mean, basically look here that, uh, um, what, 25% of the class effectively got A's. Um, so in general, the exams went well. I mean, the only reason this uh, average of 73 is that low is because some of these scores were very, very low and kind of threw off the, uh, uh, the curve. Um, and really 14, 14 out of 22 students got Caesar better on the uh, exam. Nine out of 22 got A's or B's. So the exam went pretty well uh, in the big scheme of things. So do ask yourself if you're in one of these lower categories, what happened? Um, you know, and then if you want to get together and talk about it or something, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily encouraging anybody to drop, um, but try to figure out why you didn't do well in the exam. And I would say that uh, in going back and looking from like last semester, a lot of the folks who didn't do well in this exam didn't do well in the exams last semester either and that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
Let's go right here. Yeah, if you had all the rest of this right and you just left private off of here, I wouldn't have taken points off. But uh, we've talked about how you should lock everything else down, but. Okay, so let's go back to Android stuff. Now, um, I have not given you an assignment related to Android yet, right? I was, I was demoing and I think we got up to the point where I almost launched it uh, in the, uh, so let's, I think we could probably get that complete today because then what we're going to want to do your uh, assignment over the weekend is going to be effectively to get the same hello world program working i haven't done that yet right okay got it um and the main purpose for that i mean you you'll see that it, it it's it's basically the default program they give you when you launch android studio um but the problem people typically run into is getting a virtual device working you know, uh, like I said, if you have your own Android device, you want to plug it into your computer, it'll run faster anyways. But if you don't, or you don't want to do that, there is a virtual Android device that'll show up and that's what we'll be looking at today. So just real quickly, let me just review what we did here. I'll kind of go through the motions as if I was going to create this project again, just to kind of get our brains caught back up to where we, uh, where we are. So if I were to go to file, new, new project, it would have looked something like this. I always choose empty activity when I start a new project. Um, Android will do a bunch of stuff for you. So if you're, once you become a more experienced developer and you want to use one of the pre-created things, if you just happen to know your program, your writing is gonna have tabs at the bottom, you could start with this. But I like to start with an empty activity so we can focus on, you know, the, the, the core components here. Name it whatever you want. It'll give you a default package name here. That's fine. Save it wherever you want to save it. Um, for right now, you don't actually have to go and create that directory first, like you did for GitHub. Uh, because we're, because Android Studio has a GitHub client built into it. All right, so we're going to be using Android Studio directly to upload to GitHub. All right, so store wherever you want. Make sure the language you're choosing is Java. It's probably the default, but if it's not, choose Java. The minimum SDK we talked about when we were looking at this is Android's considered to be a very fragmented ecosystem where there's lots and lots and lots of Android devices out there, but they're not all created equal. They're running different versions of the Android software. So when you go to write an application, you want that application presumably to work on as many devices as possible. And you only want to use a much newer API if you're taking advantage of some feature that like, for instance, maybe they release something in API 24 that you're going to take advantage of in your app. So then you can say, well, even though I might want my app to work on previous devices to that, the feature that I'm gonna be leveraging wasn't available to API 24. So you'll pick API 24 and just accept the fact that it's uh, not gonna work on as many devices in terms of a percentage that's out there, but it'll at least work, it'll run on all the devices that have the feature available that you're using. All right, the default they give you here is API 16 Jelly Bean, which runs on 99.8% of the devices that are out there. So this accounts for either people who have not updated their operating system because they never actually went and clicked on software update or people who are running older, older, older hardware where they, maybe they're as up to date as it can get and it's just not gonna run anything newer. Well, that might be true, but that's usually just in the newer ones, right? Sometimes a new when the new software comes out, you choose to you know, chill for a month or two and see if the, the you know, what bugs happen with it or people start getting their phones bricked or something. But generally you're not gonna be more than like one revision old or something like that if you're keeping up with it. All right, so then just click finish and you'll end up with what I have here. All right, so I have an, my application is called my application. Notice it's giving me this thing called um, so I have these folders over here on the left. I have 
a manifest folder, which you'll very rarely if ever go into. You used to have to work with this a lot more often. There's this thing in here called the Android manifest, which you used to have to go in and <clears throat> add stuff to this manually. But now uh, Android Studio populates it itself. When you create a new activity, it goes ahead and adds the the right XML stuff into that Android manifest file for your new activity. So you will rarely need to interact with this file directly. Every now and then, if you need to give it some sort of security protocol or something like that, you, you know, you Google something that says, oh, add this to your manifest file. That's when you go into this file and do something. But generally it's, and for us, we're not doing really complex things in here. We're really just kind of continuing to explore the Java stuff we were looking at, but just in the context of a of an Android application now, rather than a standalone, you know, Windows or Mac application. So we can start messing with user interfaces a little bit. Java folder, this guy has our actual code in it. You'll see that there's actually three different folders. The one we care about in here is this top one. Okay. This other one is for something called uh, unit testing. These other ones where you can set up um, for larger projects. Uh, you probably will talk about this in the software engineering class, but for larger projects, you um, do something called unit testing and also something called regression testing, where um, you know when you, when you write version one of your application, you might create three or four functions that kind of test the features of your application, right? Now, so this is kind of the idea, like when you write your homework assignment, you go through and you test your homework assignment by trying a couple of different things by hand, right? The idea of writing unit tests would be to actually write some functions that test it. And then specifically now uh, modern languages have built into it a special syntax for unit testing, where you can write uh, the methods using some extra flags where you can specifically just tell Android Studio to go and test my application. And the reason why you would do this is, let's say that you have a very large application that has 500 features in it, all right? And version one has 100 features. And so you have a whole bunch of unit tests for those 100 features. And then when version two comes out, you've added another 25 features. So you're gonna add unit tests for those 25 features, but you still expect the previous 100 things to pass. Right? You want to make sure you didn't break stuff when you added these new features. So that's the idea behind unit testing. We're writing stuff small enough in here where we're not really exploring that uh, at this point, but that's what these other versions of these directories are for, where you can create unit tests related to your, your code. So for us right now, we're just going to ignore those and we're only operating out of this folder. Okay? So we have this thing called main activity which is our Java file. Um, so this guy is, we can think of this as kind of like our main or kind of like driver that we've dealt with up to this point. Okay, and we'll go a little deeper into that uh, uh, next week when we start creating some interfaces, but we're just gonna finish up this idea of launching an application right now. All right, so this is the guy that will drive our application, that initial activity because Android applications are made up with a collection of activities. And we have the, when you first launch an app, the first activity shows up on the screen. And the first thing that happens is on create for that application. And we'll talk about uh, uh, the life cycle here, maybe even in a few minutes, or we'll talk about it on Monday. Okay, so this is our logic associated with our code. Now, Android development, as well as iOS development, follows this concept called MVC. So we have this idea of a design pattern. Have we talked about design patterns before? All right, so design pattern is a generic idea. The idea is it's a proposed good idea for solving a I'm going to put in quotes, common problem. Now, that is a really very, uh, that's a very vague thing to uh, definition for design pattern. And the reason for that is design patterns are a very vague thing. Academics love these things. 
um, because when we, you know, you have this concept in academia called publish or perish, where you have to, you know, you have to write these papers and get them published and, um, you know, at various conferences and things like that. And design patterns are the easy peasy way of doing that. Okay, because the idea is like, let's say in real life, you think you've mastered the way of making a peanut butter and jelly or making a grilled cheese or something like that, right? Some people, they, they uh, you know, they spread the peanut butter on one piece, they put the jelly in the other, they smush them together. Somebody else might, um, um, see what I do is I just put a big glob of both in the center and then I smush it together and that spreads it all out. Otherwise you tear the bread with a knife. So I have a design pattern, I have an approach to making a peanut butter and jelly that I think is the best approach. Now, maybe you think you have a better approach, all right? Both of those are valid approaches, right? You ultimately will make a peanut butter and jelly and somebody else can decide which is the best uh, approach. Uh, but usually you have to attach a crazy name to it. So most design patterns have some kind of cool, hard to follow, makes it sound smart uh, name associated with it. Um, but for us, this idea of a design pattern is this generic term that says there exists the idea that there, is, there are best practices for solving certain problems. The design pattern that we're going to consider first, which is the one that Android Studio reveals to us here, is something called the um, MVC design pattern. This stands for Model View Controller. And the model view controller design pattern basically states this. It is a good idea to keep your data, your interface, and your logic separate and have a way for them to interface with each other. Okay. That's the concept. And this really actually came out of a much older technology came out of PHP. Um, probably existed before that, but that's kind of when they came up with this, uh, uh, the, the funky name uh, for it. And somebody probably got a publication out of it. The PHP web programming language, um, what it does is you have an HTML page that has PHP code embedded inside of it. Um, and you also design, so the HTML is how you design your interface for your web your website that's what it looks like the php is what it does and then you you might be having your php code talk to some json or something like that that you also have embedded inside that same file now maybe in the early days of web programming this was okay because our websites were not nearly as complex as they are today right our websites today do tons and tons of things where they're basically full-fledged applications so if you took you know, let's say uh, like Microsoft's main portal website, uh, web page, uh, like msn.com or something like that. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on on that page. So if you were to look at the source code for that page and they didn't follow MVC at some level, what you'd see is just thousands and thousands of lines of spaghetti code with mixture together of logic, interface stuff, data, all in just one giant file. It would be very hard to manage. All right, so what do we do instead? Instead, they have template files for the way your site looks. Um, they have uh, uh, interface files, maybe it's JavaScript stuff or PHP stuff in separate files that then get brought into uh, the other file in some interesting way. But the, the, the logic is separate. So they're in two separate files. Your interface is in one file, your PHP code's in another file, and then they get merged together during runtime. All right. Design patterns are an idea. MVC in this case is a specific type of design pattern. It's the idea that it's a good idea to keep your data, your interface and your logic separate. It does not dictate the actual implementation. So we're gonna be looking at how Android Studio handles their version of MVC. If we were to go look at uh, Xcode for iOS development, you're gonna, you would see a lot of similarities because they're trying to solve the same problem, but their approach to it is a little different, okay? But ultimately they're still separating the code from the interface uh, from the data. All right, so um, 
this is already done for us by Android Studio, but it's an approach to Android Studio that uh, to Android development that we're looking at here. So right here, our main activity, this guy only has code in it. Inside of this res folder, this is our resources. And then inside of layout, this is our interface associated with that code. So if I double click on that, this shows me, hey, I have this interface thing here that just already has hello world in it. I didn't put it there. This is the default application. So this is the interface for this Android application. Now notice this guy's called activity main. And if I go to main activity here, inside of on create, notice one of the first things it does, it says, oh, by the way, this activity's content view, this activity's user interface is defined inside of this file. That's them linking those two together. Because this file has my logic in it. The other file has the, the prettiness in it. And now we need to have some way of having those two know about each other. Okay, and we'll, we'll be exploring that next week. All right, but this is the default. Okay, so that we haven't written any of this code. This is all built for us. All right, so once we're happy, we'll need to go up and um, I already have it created, but I, um, so if you go up under tools, you wanna go to something called the AVD manager. So this is your Android virtual device manager. Now, presumably you don't already have anything in here. In fact, I'll go ahead and, uh, well, I'll just create a new one. So I'm gonna do create virtual device. I'm gonna create a phone. And I usually like creating one of the pixels because it has pretty good built-in support since Android, uh, Google's making the Android Studio, Google makes the pixel. Their stuff probably works pretty well. Um, so it doesn't matter which one you pick here, I'll pick the uh, pixel three. Um, depending on the size of your screen, you might not wanna go with an XL device because it might be too big to fit in your screen, but play around with it, doesn't matter, all right? So I'll pick the Pixel 3 here. I'll go ahead and hit next. This part's the important part. You wanna make sure that you have a version of the uh, operating system that's at least as new as the API you picked. I happen to already have Android Q, which is API 29 downloaded on here. It's backwards compatible with all the older ones. If you don't already have one download, downloaded, click on one of these to download, pick on, click on Q, it doesn't matter because we're we're only dealing with API 16, so it'll work for what we're writing. I've already downloaded uh, Q. It's uh, for x86, should be under recommended images. If you don't see it there, click on x86 images, go and find it, okay? Once you have this downloaded, select Q, hit next. And so I'll, this, this is gonna name this guy Pixel 3 API 29, so I'll hit finish. All right, so there's the guy I just created. Can I just delete this one? So, okay, here. So I'll delete this other one just so it's not in our way. So there's the one virtual device I've created there. So now you should be able to close this. Should be able to come up here and uh, hit play. Oh, I noticed there's an update. Um, I'll go ahead and launch this device because I think it had defaulted to my Pixel 4, the thing I'd already had in there. So I'll just go ahead and launch this device, which should give me my virtual device. So here it is. So it's effectively, you just took your phone out and turned it on. It's gonna boot up and then we will hit Play on it once it's done booting up. And hopefully it jumps over to this new device that I have on there because it picked up my Pixel 4.
just says restart Android Studio. I'll just do that real quick and it should just work because it'll pick up that uh, that device. You shouldn't have to do this for yours because you just created the, the device. Okay, well, I'll let this finish doing. I'll keep the video going. Uh, for Monday, get your own Android Hello World program working, just like we're going to have working here in a second at the end of the video. Notice it says loading devices here, so it's loading for my ABD devices. Once that's done, it's using something called Gradle. So once that's done building and I see all my stuff here, I'll be able to hit play, and this guy will have your fancy schmancy Hello World application uh running inside of it all right so notice it found my pixel 3 this time um it's still loading over there so i'm not sure if this will just run but we'll try it so i'll go ahead and click run oh yeah yeah i guess i do need to finish letting it load over there and there's your hello world program Okay, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. So we didn't actually write any code. We just used Android Studio to make all these things uh, launch. We looked at it right here, the activity main that has hello world in it. They do it for us. You don't have to do any of that, it just happens. All I want you to have for Monday is this screen it's in the interface file but you didn't have to write it for this one it automatically creates a default hello world for you yeah take a picture of your uh running hello world thing effectively it'll just be full credit if you do it because i'll then be able to trust that you have android studio working and when i give you a homework assignment you can't come back and say oh i don't have a virtual device working cool all right, I will see everybody on Monday. Well, yeah, these are two separate files. This is activity main XML and this is main activity that Java. Correct.